This is The Politics of Everything, and I'm your host, Amber Danes. Welcome to the podcast where we want to discuss the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment to equality, and much more. Our guests are experts in their field or topic of choice, even if you've not yet heard their name. This is a bipartisan podcast, so while we love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate, by no means is this a one-sided forum for any one political view. So please listen up and enjoy the politics of everything. Pets are big business. Just ask Annika Vandenbroek, the founder and CEO of Rufus & Coco, which is Australia's fastest growing and most awarded pet brand. Launched in 2008, the company is reshaping the pet industry by offering ranges of well-branded and packaged product, covering animals from horses to hamsters, and the pet range includes grooming tools and vitamins. Having racked up a swag of business awards, Annika has capitalised the global phenomenon of people viewing their fur babies as part of the family. Prior to running Rufus & Coco, Annika had a high-flying corporate career in marketing and general management with roles at companies such as Blackmores and David Jones. Today, she's my guest to discuss the politics of business innovation. Hello, Annika. Hello, Amber. Well, let's dive into the topic. What does business innovation mean to you? Look, business innovation to me really means survival. It's about transformation. You need to consider, I suppose, when you have a business that everybody is always moving ahead with their plans. So to stop actually innovating either, you know, your business model or your product ranges, even the way you serve the market, you know, effectively you're going backwards. You know, I'm really proud to say that as part of the small business and small team that I have here at Rufus & Coco, you know, we've really worked hard with some of the customers that we work with, such as Woolworths and Coles, to continue to innovate new methods to maintain price. So, with dealing with those retailers, they don't allow you to increase your prices. So you can imagine we went into Woolworths in 2010 and we're now in 2017. There's been a lot of price increases and changes over that time. So we've worked really hard to make sure that we've re-engineered all of our processes, the way we've packed our products, the manufacturers, the way we do even our finance, every single cost to actually control the cost to the customer and the other thing that we work really hard at, and I suppose in terms of innovation, I really think of it as two things, one being either a new method or two being a new idea. And certainly we now have 66 lines in Woolworths. So we have expanded significantly you know, in that channel. And I think a great example of our innovation is our wee kitty clumping corn litter, which took us 18 months to develop. And um, it, it, it does actually outperform every one of the litters on the market that we've tested. It's flushable, it's biodegradable, it is low dusting, and it's made from corn, which is a very sustainable source. And and now we it's the fastest growing litter in this country and we sell it into nine countries abroad. That's amazing. And as an owner of a cat, I can totally appreciate that. The, the well, need for something that's some. have you tried that? Yeah, we have to get you some. I I definitely have tried it and it's definitely the preference in our household for sure. So with business innovation, that would have been probably part of the core of Rufus & Coco when you began um, almost a decade ago. Lots of changes have happened to the small business arena since you launched back then. You've given us a little taste of what some of those um, innovations that you've incorporated are, but when you started the business, did did you imagine there'd be so many changes and needs for innovation or were you slightly naive about that? Look, I've, I've, as you said in the introduction, I've come from big business. And so I, and I've always personally, I suppose, been the type of person that's always looked to do things better. And so, no, I always believed that where we would start is not necessarily where we'd end up, you know, even by the end of the year, let alone in three years' time. And I think very much the way that we've infused business innovation at Rufus and Coco is by, I suppose, by hiring the right people to start with. You know, I talk about my, the people that join our business as though they're unicorns, people that come to create magic every day. They really look at problems as opportunities to solve, solve for the issues that either the consumers face or the problems we have with getting packs to people in the right time or the way that we enter new markets and making innovation a cultural norm 
And it is very much about uh, leadership, of course. So it's very much about role modeling what is the expectation of people's thinking around innovation. So we do an interesting exercise, which is called a painted picture. And we do this every year. And a painted picture is like, takes a big picture view of and builds a long-term strategy. And it's about imagining what the business will look like in five years, far enough for it, a way to, for it to be a big dream. And then we add pictures to it to sort of bring it to life. And the idea is that once everyone is engaged in this process, everyone can sort of imagine what the ending looks like as though it's a movie. And therefore, the steps that you need to take to get there, it's almost obvious what the steps are. I mean, it's not obvious, but, you know, with good planning, um, I think that long, long range planning that is means that it's not in the day with all the limitations set in people's minds mean that people, honestly, the team come up with the most amazing ideas as to how we should grow and expand and overcome the challenges, you know, in each market that we face because we now operate in nine markets. That's incredible. That's amazing. I'm just getting that vision of exactly how your your business is operating and I, I find that really inspirational. And I guess I'd be curious to, to find out, you know, you've had a corporate career prior. It sounds like innovation is in your mindset from from wherever you are. But was it very different to mastering innovation in a corporate environment where there's lots more resources and teams and things around you that, and it's also not your own money in those early days, to where you are now in terms of how nimble you have to be or you like to be in a small business? I mean, can you sort of compare it from your experience? Oh, gee, look, I would I would agree that innovation is different because, and I know that we're talking about the politics of innovation and and I think that is the challenge in big business, certainly in a lot of my roles leading the marketing teams and, and the product development teams, you know, it can get quite political what people think about your new idea and the amount of uh, hurdles that are put in place for you to actually bring that product to market are limiting. And, you know, unless you've got the right people working with you, they're just completely worn out because by the time they've had to justify it 10 ways and put hypotheticals together with all the costs, the risks, the, you know, everything, they're like, I can't even be bothered, you know, launching this idea anymore. This is the most rewarding thing about being in small business is that you can literally have an idea and make it happen quickly. And, um, and you know, it really is it really is the be- one of the best things, that and I think being able to choose your own people. But, look, I do recall um, a great example of big business that really did stand on its tail and get innovative was when I was the director of marketing for Blackmores and I experienced the world's largest recall of consumer products. So Pan Pharmaceuticals Recall, it was called. Basically, that manufacturer made most of the products in the market and they were recalled. And so overnight, um, literally, uh, we worked through the night with the, the operations teams, the product teams, the entire business to make sure that we could meet the market's demand for um, products because literally their shelves were wiped out, um, tell consumers what was happening. And I think it was such an interesting event for me, uh, especially with hindsight, because really it just brought everyone onto the same page really quickly. And everyone was working on one thing, and that was to overcome that challenge. And I think that's the thing in small business. Um, we do a whole lot of things internally in this business. We do we do stand-up meetings. We do team meetings. We do all sorts of things. We even have a WhatsApp channel, you know, just to make sure that everyone is always on the right page. We're on this page today, guys. We're going this way. And that's, you know, when, when you get into big business, it gets very political. It's very hard to get everyone on the same page quickly. So Australians are spending $12 billion a year on food, grooming, pets and insurance for their animals. Pet industry is obviously a major growth hotspot in the country's business sector. I'm really curious to know why this is the case more so now than a generation ago perhaps. I mean, why? what's the backstory to the, to the business story of, of pet care? Look, it's a, it's a great one. Um, there's a number of social trends that are increasing pet parenthood, if you like. So people delaying um, their their own parenthood of children, human children, um, people choosing to have smaller families and people living longer. And I think what's happening is that people, there's a real trend towards people humanising their pets, treating the pets as part of the family. You know, it's what some analysts would call the rise of the fur baby. And um, 
I think the great thing is, well, certainly we find with the Rufus and Coco customers that are real pet lovers, they they will prioritize spending on their animals over themselves often. And um, we see that the way that they're treating their animals is, is as they would a child, letting them sleep on the bed and, and talking to them. Certainly I talk to my cats like they're part of the, um, you know, <laughs> part of the family. They get spoken to all the time. And the great thing about I think what's supporting the growth is a few things. Um, one is that this type of spending is guilt-free. So, you know, it's kind of like I haven't spent the money on myself. I'm spending it on my favorite friend. And we are finding that, so 14.9% of Australians even uh, say that they are planning to have a pet in the next 12 months. So currently Australia is at 63%. um, And it is in fact the second fastest growing category outside consumer electronics. Uh, So, you know, it really is quite a recession-proof category. And it's very interesting because I started this business in the middle of the global financial crisis. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like you would have seen it at the opposite end in the early days where, I mean, I guess in those early days, based on the economic situation, were people spending less then uh, 10 years ago than they are now per sort of household, if you like? They were, absolutely. And part of the reason for that is services has been such a growth area. People taking their animals to the groomy, groomers and and um, and I suppose just the general economics of the country, you know, people have more disposable income. I think the thing I love about it, Amber, is that, you know, pets are really great for humans. It's been proven that great pets are great for your physical health. You know, they get you to walk around the block more. They're great for your f- mental health. It's been proven that, um, you know, people are – the emotional connectedness um, that people have with their animals it has great – uh, effects on reducing anxiety. You know, people are less likely to visit a doctor. It's it's a really it's it's a big and growing industry. And and the great thing that I love about it is we obviously love pets as a business at Rufus and Coco, but it's great for humans everywhere. Absolutely, yeah. There's definitely a win win there. So going back to 2008 or maybe a little bit earlier, what sparked an interest for you to create your own pet brand? I mean, what did you see in the market that was lacking 10 years ago that needed innovation? And how did you even get started? Were you kind of doing it as a side hustle? Did you leave corporate? Like, what was the transition like as well? Oh, well, look, having over, having owned over 40 pets in my life, I was really frustrated with the lack of kind of desirable and poorly made products and natural alternatives. And I couldn't find a brand that I really felt connected with. I couldn't even recall a brand really that stood for accessories and grooming products. And I could see the growth in um, what was happening in the human, in the, in the pet category and the humanization of pets. Um, And so I felt that I always wanted to run my business. And ironically, when I started my first entrepreneurial endeavor at the age of eight, I think I was, was to breed mice and sell them to the pet shop, not just any mice, Amber, ones that had little diamonds in their foreheads. And, you know, I think I sold them for about 20 to 50 cents a pop or something like that. So it's kind of ironic to have circled back to this. But um, I always wanted to, I always wanted to have my own business. And, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of is that at Rufus and Coco, we also give a lot of money back to the World Animal Protection. And to date, we've saved over 30,000 dogs' lives in a program that they have called Collars Not Cruelty. And what they do is they vaccinate dogs with rabies in impoverished countries. And because the people there can identify the dog as a safe dog, they actually stop inhumanely killing that dog and they actually befriend the dog. And it's very interesting because I spend my time in sort of third world countries, if you like. In many of these countries, they don't even think that animals have feelings. You know, they've got no... That's terrible. They've got no concept of that. It's unconscionable for us, right? But... But for them, they don't. So this program has really um, is really helping, and I think that was very much a part of the legacy I wanted to have. And certainly, we will grow our endeavours in the social space over time at Rufus and Coco. Um, but that's something that we do that we do today. And look, the transition was not easy um, because I launched the business at the same time as having my first child. So quite two quite steep two, learning curves. Two babies at once, basically. It's like having twins. OMG. <laughs> But, um, but going back to the concept of innovation, I think that my greatest innovation through that has really been the self-innovation. You know, how do you take this woman that's worked in corporate, in senior jobs, having all these people do everything for her, who's a bit of a perfectionist, 
to then starting up her business where she has to do it all herself and fund it all herself um, and and let go of the perfectionism because she now has a baby to feed while she's typing emails. You know, so I think that has been probably my self development through <laughs> through managing to juggle kind of starting up this business has been um, has been massive. I was going to touch on that. So obviously now you've had two children. So having two children and a growing business that obviously was going from strength to strength, but I'm sure had its own, you know, hiccups like all businesses do, that must have required a degree of innovation in terms of keeping all those balls in the air, as they say. I mean, any sort of sort of reflections on that process, how you've had to sort of grow a business and raise children? Wow. It was, um, look, I think, I think the biggest lessons for me are to give up other people's expectations of what a mother does. You know, I think that's a that might seem like a funny thing to say, but certainly when I grew up, my mother did not work. And all you did was, uh, not all you did, because it's a massive role, as we both know, of being mothers, but you just did that. You didn't work at the same time. So part of being able to manage this was part of being able to be true to myself and... Um, and let go of other people's expectations. I think the other thing is I'm a complete time Nazi and I'm very conscious in how I spend my time. I'm very conscious in how I actually um, you know, manage my diary and who I talk to and spend time with and, and, the, and the company I, I keep, you know. And I think that um, I think that it's look, it's been a massive juggle. I, people talk about balance, but I just sort of think that it's kind of – it is a bit like a fusion and a bit like a melting pot. Um, I'm really proud of the role I play as a parent. I'm very con- I mean, I'm a very conscious parent. I mean, we have a technology-free household at home. Um, and, you know, if you come to the dinner table, you get prepared to talk about what your day is. And you're not allowed to bring, um, you know, mummy's not allowed to have her iPhone. Like I turn my iPhone off. And, and I, you know, spend, I make sure I use the, use better quality time, I think, when the kids and use my time with them also very intentionally. But I do try and integrate the kids into, you know, the business where it makes sense. They will come and sell products at trade stands and or, or consumer events. And, you know, my daughter came to the Telstra Business Awards, which I was so proud of, you know, the year that we won the Micro Business Awards, which was 2016. And, and, you know, she was so excited. I mean, she went and shared the news with all her friends at school. And, and I think now, you know, the kids, yesterday we were shooting a cat, uh, cat videos at my house. You know, the, the kids are in and out of the house while we're shooting cat videos. And so it's sort of become part of their life. I mean, they walk into the office now like they own the place and they're like, who are you? They come up to the new people. They're like, who are you? I'm Saxon. You know, they introduce themselves like that. But so I think. Yes, and and I guess that blending is really a key part of that innovation in in life as well as business. I'm I'm all for the idea. You really can't put things in silos when you are raising a family and running a business and so forth. And I think with technology, you're very wise to have time away from it. But um, unfortunately, it's also allowed us in some ways to blend a bit more. I don't actually think think of anything that I can't do. We work on cloud based. Um, an operating system and AI system. I mean, obviously with the iPhones and videos and things that you can, all the um, apps that are on these things, you know, it's it's incredible. But um, yeah, so technology is a massive enabler. So some of the challenges that you might have faced um, in in your business, how did you use innovation to come overcome them? I'm sure there's many, but there's anything that stands out for you in terms of something big and then how you've had to innovate um, to move forward? I was reflecting on this and and you're right there have been so many and so many big ones you know I think I think when I reflect back on trying to start out and people sort of say look you know and I remember doing all these forecasts on what I thought I'd do as the business and whatever whatever and and um and it was a year of so I'd started in 2008 it was the year of 2010 I remember um Stephen saying to me you know if you don't sort of I mean by then we had 400 and something customers but it really wasn't enough to sustain the business. And the vision that we had was to be a, um, a, a health and beauty brand for pets in Australia. And that meant also selling into grocery. You know, I wanted our brand to be accessible to everyone. I didn't want just the, the people with the higher incomes to be able to access it. So it actually took four presentations to crack grocery. We didn't manage to crack grocery until 2010. Um, so I think part of 
part of what I did there is I could every time I went to go and speak to them, I could see that I, I tried to address their limitations. So whatever it was, like, oh, I don't want to open up a separate account for not so many products. Oh, you haven't got a track record enough yet. All these, you know, limitations that people kept on presenting forward. So to overcome that roadblock, I forged a relationship with leading grocery distributor McPherson's Consumer Products. And by leveraging McPherson's existing account base and their, um, you know, pre-signed terms with these massive retailers, we managed to actually crack grocery. But I will add that it was on my fourth conversation to a buyer in Germany that we managed to actually secure ranging or get her to actually even take my phone call. Um, and she basically, her name was Jennifer Rogers, and she basically said to me, Annika, come and see me when you get back. That was in May. And by October, we were on the shelves in 900 Woolworth stores, and that was a massive um, turning point. So I think I think trying to find a different way every time you hit a, hit a challenge, it's like trying to understand it, not just, you know, put up a brick wall and kind of go, oh, my God, goodness, you know, trying to actually, um, I suppose, manage your own response to it in a way so that you're still listening to what the person is telling on the other side of the desk and you sort of want to jump over and choke them because they can't see the opportunity. Um, and and the innovation in, in trying new ways, so the idea of getting the distributor on board to overcome the issue and, and just not giving up. I mean, you just can't afford to give up. Absolutely. I think not giving up and persistence is the message I'm hearing as well as the innovation. So obviously you're a decade into the business. What's next? What do you hope to achieve with Rufus and Coco? I mean, obviously you're not going to share anything or well, you might share something that we don't already know, but is there something, you know, in the pipeline in the next sort of decade you'd like to see happen or is it about transitioning out of the business perhaps? Uh, no, very much we're in here for the long haul. We absolutely love it um, and, you know, we really do come to work to market and develop you know, good quality, fashionable, affordable uh, products that solve consumers' needs. We have a vision of improving the well-being of 5 million pets across the globe within three years. Uh, we plan to be a global brand uh, of well-bred pet care. And uh, really, we plan to extend our social endeavours to, um, you know, give back and help um, more. Um, certainly, um, I see that there's an opportunity to work with uh, work with organisations to actually change the uh, the laws as they res- as they are now with people in rented and strata accommodation. You know, it's quite interesting. There's a lot of really good statistics to say that a child will actually do more damage to a strata place than a pet. Yet, um, about 51% of Australians are prohibited from owning a pet because the laws prohibit them from from doing so. So, we're hoping to work with the right partners to. Um, overcome that limitation and, and so Melbourne have been the first to move on that so we've got lots of uh, great things to do and um, and look the best part about it really is that we we get a lot of spontaneous feedback from our customers to talk about you know the visible difference we're making to their lives and their pet and um, and and so really that's the thing that sort of motivates us to keep going every day. Absolutely so um, my questions I always ask my guests the final two I'm now presenting to you do you have any special mentors or inspirational people in your life that have helped you on this journey and what have they taught you it might be just one it might be a couple and they don't obviously have to be famous. My mentor of four years who is absolutely amazing his name is Andrew Smith and he's the Commonwealth um, Sorry, he's the CEO of CDHS and, look, he has taught me how to focus. Uh, certainly, I'm very good with shiny pennies. I like things that are new and I have too many ideas to execute. <laughs> and so what he's taught me is to get laser focused on the strategy, myself and the team, so that um, we really, you know, set a direction, keep going direction. And um, I think the second group I would say is the Entrepreneurs Organisation. It's called EO. Basically, it's a collection of entrepreneurs or members um, from around the world. There's about 14,000 of us that have businesses that turn over more than 5 million US. And they break us down into forums of eight. And, you know, it's a diverse bunch of people, everyone from people that run liquor groups to um, online businesses to being lawyers and service providers. But every month we come together and we share our business challenges in a really open, honest way. And I have to say these people are what I would coin move a dead boyfriends. You know, people you'd, turn, you'd call in the middle of the night when you needed to move a dead boy without any judgment. And, um, you know, they're the people that would rock up. It's been, it's been so amazing. And I think, look, it's as a result of people being gracious enough to have the time to mentor me that I've also chosen to um, mentor. I'd now mentor four people that have business that turn over more than 500,000. And um, so I, I do that. And I started a, a network of um, business women as well. It's called Women of EO. So, 
So I also spend my time sort of giving back because I really believe that um, I, re- I really believe energetically that actually that will bring you more than a lot of other things you can do. Absolutely. So the final piece of advice for anyone who wants to get ahead in the politics of business innovation, what would that be, Annika? Oh, final piece of advice is um, honestly, I think you need to love what you do. I think that um, if you love what you do, you will continue to innovate because when you experience the inevitable setbacks, um, your own energy will help to guide the team. And um, I think it's so important to commit to continual learning and self-development and to nurture yourself because running your own business is, is like it's more than tiring. It's exhausting. And um, it's kind of like being in a marathon and you cannot run a marathon every day at the same speed. Um, I think the second thing is to work with great people that are the right fit you know, internally and externally, make sure they understand the vision and their role. You know, we treat our suppliers very much like they're part of the team. And um, so they know exactly where we're going and they know exactly what we want. And often they all come to us with ideas of innovation. And I think last but least is to, um, not least, I should say, um, most importantly, is to listen to your customers. You know, they really are the heartbeat. You know, it's about making it easy for them. That's why we exist, to make, you know, well-read pet care that makes their lives easy, to love their pet. And um, if you, if you, I think you need to find your customers' pain points and from that you'll find areas of um, that you need to innovate from. Well, that's great advice. It's been a pleasure to have you on the on the show. If you do want to connect further with Rufus and Coco or Annika, there will be some details on our show notes. You've been listening to The Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes. Until next time. Thanks for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, we thrive on feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network and your friends and family. I'm also always on the hunt for fabulous new guests. So if you've got a view to share and an idea how to get our listeners excited, please email me at amber at bespokecoms, that's B-E-S-P-O-K-E-C-O-M-M-S.com.au and we'll be sure to get back to you. Until next time.